Hello, and welcome to Covenant Bible Fellowship this morning. I um, hope that we've all enjoyed the snow Amen. this past week. I know I did. I, I, I love snow, um, but I have a... Um, I, I have a special kind of joy when I get to go outside and, and uh, yeah, basically, play. <laughs> special kind of joy when I get to see God's nature uh, and have a little bit of extra time off. <clears throat> but I'll tell you this, um, the Lord speaks to me most often when I'm doing. Um, I don't know if... That's the same with everyone else, but uh, he, he speaks to me most often when I'm when I'm doing, when I'm working, when I'm trying to get something done. That's when I find that I'm able to commune with him the most, and I think it's because he designed us to work. But um, today we're going to be talking about a passage of scripture, primarily, uh, at least that's where the title comes from, uh, that has... I have always interpreted it incorrectly, and the Lord uh, showed me that, corrected me to a co-worker of mine, um, and it was really, it's its kind of a joyful thing when you see something new, so I'm, I'm filled with joy. Of course, I'm also filled with joy because today is my anniversary, so that's awesome. Um, but the, the sermon today is called The Kingdom of Priests. The kingdom of priests. Let's go to the Lord in prayer real quickly. Lord, thank you so much for blessing us with your presence. Thank you for giving us your joy and your peace. Help us to um, to be lit up like this Christmas tree over here. You know, we can be um, filled with the presence of God everywhere we go. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What does it mean to rule and reign together with Christ? That's the big question that we're going to be tackling. What does it mean to rule and reign together with Christ? 2 Timothy 2.12 says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. It's pretty clear. We have a, a clear mission uh, that's been given to us to, as we go into the world, to be lights in the world. In fact, I'm going to have a scripture a little bit later that says that we are to be shining like lights in the universe. We are like stars in the world. Revelation 1.6 and actually 5.10 as well uh, both allude to this. They say that we are kings and priests. At least that's the way that we're used to reading it. Um, and this is one of those things where I've always just taken it at face value and I never actually looked to see what is the original language? How does this describe? And um, I was discussing uh, heavenly things at work, as I want to do when the night grows late and calls drop down and we're sitting around for an hour doing nothing but chain to a computer. Um, and there's nothing left to do except for talk. And so, of course, if you're talking with me, generally that means the conversation is going to go in a particular direction. But um, we were having this conversation, and he said, he said, well, what are you king of? Hmm. I said, because we've been made kings and priests. He said, that's not in scripture. I was like, yeah, it is. And I showed it to him. So Revelation 1, 6, it made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever. Now that seems pretty clear. And he said, well, what are you king of? The chair you're sitting on? If everybody's a king, what are you king of? Well, I wasn't sure. I wanted to do a study. So I looked it up, and it turns out that's not what the verse says at all. In fact... What it actually says is, he hath made us a kingdom priests. Yeah. That's like a direct interlinear translation without right. the, the fixing. He has made us a kingdom priests. Priest in the kingdom. Many translations now are actually putting this through as he has made us a kingdom of priests. And my friend... He is, um, he, he grew up in the Jewish faith. He actually reads and writes in Aramaic, Hebrew. He's quite familiar. And so he said, you know, this part's in Greek. But um, 
he said, I, I, I need to let you know something. Perhaps you already know this, but during that time when this was written, to be a priest was to be a bureaucrat. Exactly. It was to be a ruler. There were two heads of state. Right. The high priest and the head of the courts. Cool. That's it. There you are. The king was something that was appointed. That was something that was brought in after the fact, and the people recognized that. And so when Jesus used the term priest, people knew what he was talking about. And when in Revelation it says that he's made you a kingdom of priests, he's saying you have a part of ruling. Yeah. But he's not saying you're the king. See, we're part of a kingdom of which the high priest is head. Let's take a look at Hebrews. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now that is an amazing thing. That gives us the freedom that we have to know that our sins are covered and that we have an advocate with the Father, right? But that also makes us members of a holy government. It does. Lower member, higher member, who cares? You're a part of a holy government. You're a part of that hierarchy. All of us serve and obey God. Now, does that start after we die? No, it starts now. Genesis 1.26 gives us our very first dominion claim. It says, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Let them have dominion. Ephesians 2, 5 through 6. If we take a look at that. Our authority here, it says, even when we were dead in sins, and hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And many translations actually translate this to saying, sitting like on the bench with him. All right? Which is to say you're sitting in rulership. Sitting in heavenly places. Sitting in a place of authority. See, our authority comes from serving God. Colossians 3.24 says, Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Your authority and your power don't come from you, and they aren't a blanket grant by God to do what you want. You can't use them like magic, right? This is a simple fact that you're operating in his name. And so you have authority. So we do reign. But we reign as servants. Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6 sort of explains this. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Again, that doesn't make us kings, but it certainly does make us priests. Because we reign as servants. And Jesus, who was the great high priest, was the servant of all. Amen? Amen? But if we are servants, we must obey. That's what Romans tells us. Romans 6, 16, it says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? We cannot fulfill this important role if we are corrupted by evil communication. The only way for us to be the mouthpiece of God is for us to have a pure mouth. The only way for us to make an impact for the kingdom here in this life while we're trying actively to overcome our sin is to have pure communication. Let's take a look at... Ephesians. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. You guys read this earlier. 
but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. It was funny, the question came up actually at work, part of our other conversations, about what is my official title? <laughs> I was like, well, pastor. And they said, well, what's the difference between a pastor and a minister? I said, well, denomination, I guess. And, and my friend was very disappointed. He said, man, I thought it would be like after you lead the forces of good to victory, you get a black belt and get to call yourself a minister now. Not exactly. But the fact of the matter is that we are all ministers of the gospel because to minister means to serve. And ministry is service. Right. And to be a minister is to be a servant. And so if we are to open our mouths, then the communication which comes out of them should be ministering, should be serving those around us. It should be uplifting. It should be positive. It should be edifying. If we take a look at Philippians 4, 8. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. The good stuff. That's the focus, the good stuff. It directs us to think on things above. This is all the more important when we remember that our focus becomes our actions. Right. Now, that sounds very world philosophy psychology ish but it really isn't see they they took it from scripture scripture had it first let's take a look at uh, luke 6 verse 45 it says a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil for of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh Matthew 5, 37 gives us a warning. It says, let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Let me put those two together. That means anything you say that goes above and beyond the simple answer that's required for the situation so that you can send a little jab or something like that comes of the abundance of the evil in your heart. Your evil's showing. It's gooing out over your tongue. It's dripping. You should wipe that off a little. Matthew 15, 10 through 11. It says, Then he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Does anyone in here doubt the ability of Scripture to wash your heart clean? Mm -hmm. See, the Bible tells us very clearly that Scripture, and putting Scripture in you, it's, it's a well of water, living water. And that the living water that Jesus gives stays within you as a flowing stream, if you will, to continually wash you clean. So how come we aren't clean yet? You want me to tell you? Simple. You keep dirtying it. <laughs> hey. I'm serious. You do. I do too. Every time you say something garbagey, you're putting more dirt down there. And then you go read the Bible, and you read the words of God, and you think about them, and you meditate on them, and it washes it away, and you go dirty it again. And every time you turn away from the perfect law of liberty, every time you turn away from the law of God, you forget what you looked like. And you forget all the garbage that's going on, and you just go over here, and you throw another dirty word. I'm not just talking about cursing. In fact... That's kind of a minor thing on the scale. Most of the stuff that you're going to be messing with is going to be backbiting, derogatory comments, all sorts of, of lovely little Grinch-like stuff that we like to pull. Hmm. 
We've got to watch what we say. Yeah. Philippians 2.15. Philippians 2.15 is the verse I mentioned earlier. It says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. How can we shine without speaking? 1 John 3.18 doesn't say not to speak. It says to not stop with speaking. You have to speak and do, right? Amen. You can't just do either. You have to talk and do. You have to do both. Amen. It says, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And again, if you read this in a lot of other translations, if you go back to the original language, it's not saying don't speak. It's saying don't only speak. Right. Right. Should you actually back up your words? We must speak the truth, in fact, but it must be motivated by love. We're required to speak the truth. We're watchmen on the wall. We've been given the future. We've been given the facts. We've been told of the wrath to come, and if we don't tell someone else of the wrath to come, it's on our heads, right? But if we speak the truth, which we must, Ephesians 4.15 says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. We must be motivated by love. So I'm going to get a little personal. All of this means that we cannot use passive-aggressive jibes. We cannot use cutting remarks. We can't have the... <sighs> all right we got to cut that out. It's filthy communication. It goes beyond a simple yes or no, and it exposes and simultaneously corrupts our inner man. Now, I, I like to use Christ's example. Christ himself watched his words. He said so. John 12, verses 40 through 4 through 50. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words, and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak, and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Jesus watched his words. Jesus spoke the living word of God. He spoke what the Father told him to say. He similarly said that he didn't and would not act without God's example. John 5, 19, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Now, I want to point something out. We have some kids back here. And these kids are lovely little bundles of joy who follow their father's every movement. <laughs> And what he does, they do. And you know, we don't often think of Jesus this way, but Jesus is the son. And he followed his father's movements. And whatever the father did, he did. Whatever the father said, he said. He followed his father. He's our example because he shows us the Father. John 17, verses 25 through 26 tell us that. He says, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Let me explain that a different way. If you've known me, you've known the Father, he said. 
I will show you the Father. You don't know the Father unless you know me. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he said. There's a lot in Scripture that points to this, where he is the guiding light directing us to the Father. He, it's his example that shows us the Father. And so as the Father, we should be following his every move. We should be hearing every word he says and repeating it. We should be following suit. John 10, 27 to 28 says that. It says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now I want you guys to remember something. Our words do have authority. As Christians, we have been given a grant of authority. And so when you speak a word, you speak with authority whether you realize it or not. Which means when you speak negative things over people, over situations, I'm, I'm not claiming some sort of magic power, I'm not claiming a magic grant where you can just kind of say whatever you want and it's going to happen. All right, That's not what I'm saying because that's not what the Bible says. But what I am telling you is that you are causing your own problems when you see something small and complain about it. Because you're making it something big. And it will continue to snowball. Snow is fun. Snowballing into a bad situation is not fun. And when you speak death to an organization, to a family, to a friendship, even to yourself, you are messing up. That is an error on your behalf. It's wrong. So you may not think of yourself in this way, but you do have authority. You have a responsibility to uphold the trust that God has put in you. You speak on his behalf here on earth. You are a servant. As long as you obey. Be a good steward of that. Think on things above. And then speak on those things. Because the thing is, when you speak a bad thing, you corrupt your heart. When you speak a good thing, you support your heart. And when I say heart, I'm not talking about the old heart. I'm talking about the new heart of flesh that God put in you when he made you a new creature. If you want to support your desire to do good, speak it. Think about it. Say it, do it, and reinforce the kingdom. Proverbs 14, verse 1 says, Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. Which works for men, too, by the way. As priests, we are the example for many. We are the pillars of the kingdom. Those around you should always be inspired by you, by your positivity, by your energy, by your support, by your joy. Don't make it a duty to act that way. That'll completely ruin the whole thing, all right? Instead, first make it a duty to think that way. That's a choice. It's an action. If I leave you with anything, I'm going to... Leave you here, Romans 14, verse 7, it says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. We need support. Mm -hmm. We're in this together. We need support. We're in this together. Scripture says that a threefold cord is not easily broken. You are one of those pieces. So think on things above for your own cord. We are one of those pieces. So don't forsake this fellowshipping of the brethren. Amen. That's the second chord, and God is the third. Make sure that you are in communion with him. If it's just you and us, I don't know. But if it's you and it's us and it's God, the threefold chord is not easily broken, okay? Amen. We are a kingdom of priests. Amen. Dad, could you lead us in joy to the world? Page 61. I know we sang it a couple times already, but you know what? 
It's a good one. It is. is. Sixty-one. <clears throat> Joy to the world, the, the Lord, Lord has come. come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing joy to the earth the savior reigns let men their songs employ while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains, repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more the sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. For as the curse is down, for as the curse is down, for as the curse is found, he rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove. The glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and his wonders of his love. Thank you, Lord, for your love and thank you for coming for us to show that to us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.